Good afternoon. Welcome to EduSet Network. Friend, today we will have discussion on Delhi Sultanate economy. Uh, you know, after Turkish invasion, a new setup came into existence, and the Delhi Sultanate, uh, some of the previous uh, practices of the economy was uh, adopted, some reforms were taken. So, we will try to understand the various facets of economic during this period, and the reforms taken by the different rulers, and what was its repercussion. And for discussion on this very topic, we have in the studio Dr. Vipul Singh. He teaches history at uh, Motila Nehru College, University of Delhi, and presently associate professor there. And Dr. Singh has written many books, and recently a uh, book on environmental come in, uh, to the market uh, from a reputed publisher, Macmillan. The book name is The Human Footprints of Environments. And Dr. Singh has been also awarded uh, Carson Fellowship at Russell Carson Center of Germany. So his knowledge and experience uh, certainly will help us to understand the economy of the Delhi Sultanate in a new perspective. So on behalf, I welcome Dr. Singh for a recent lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, friends. Yesterday, uh, we talked about the two extreme viewpoints on the economy of the early medieval period. We saw how the Marxist scholars believed that this early medieval period, the so-called early medieval period of Indian history was a period of decline, a period of disintegration, not only in terms of politics, but also in terms of economy. So overall picture given for this period on the basis of the available sources was that you know, the land grant system as such led to the formation of Samantas, Mahasamantas, further leading to the self sufficient village economy. And then, as a result, there was no much surplus available for trade. Now, in the same context, as you know that with the decline of trade, the urban centers were also seen as being declining over a period of time. But then came another viewpoint and that, it, that has been the main emphasis of historians over the last two decades the new breed of historians like Bidhi Chattopadhyay, Harman Kulke, Ranabir Chakravarti and many others have tried to look at this period from a different perspective. They have tried to see this period at local levels. They have seen this period as a period of integration rather than disintegration and they try to explain this period in terms of economic proliferation. But apart from that, I would like to take you back to this first interpretation of history that is the model called the Indian feudalism. Now if you look at that model, and the period that now we are going to study today, that is the period of Delhi Sultanate, there is some kind of a connection. And even among the scholars, you will find that when the Marxist scholars tend to explain this period in terms of disintegration, there will be a new period which will be taken up by another group of Marxist scholars for a different period of time who would justify that this period of disintegration was somehow converted into 
a period of prosperity by another set of rulers. So, trying to look this period of Delhi Sultanate in this context would make the history much more interesting. As I mentioned in my earlier lecture also, that this earlier, early medieval period of Indian history is much more dependent on uh, primary sources such as inscriptional records and archaeological excavations. But the moment we move to the Delhi Sultanate period, the emphasis on primary sources shift from archaeological and inscriptional sources to those of the literary sources. Now, that is a very important development in terms of historiography. Now, why I am trying to highlight these aspects of historiography when we are trying to understand the economy of the period is because of certain reasons. You know, for the earlier period, when you do not have much literary sources available, then you have the alternative sources, like you have the inscriptional records and you have the archaeological records. But then there are certain positive aspects of those sources, like inscriptional records and archaeological excavated records. They cannot be easily manipulated. But if we look at the literary sources, there are greater chances of manipulation in those literatures. Now, manipulation not uh, in terms of you know changing the words or changing the writing as such which were written during those days. Manipulation means influencing the writer himself or the writer getting influenced by certain local conditions in the environments. What I am trying to suggest is that although the period of Delhi Sultanate is full of literary sources, you have whole lot of Persian documents, chronicles, but there are chances of those literatures being influenced by the state. Now, there is a reason behind it. Of course, this concept of writing chronicles came with the Turks in India. That is the official chroniclers were appointed by the state, the sultans, and they were sponsored by the ruler to write the history of their king or their sultan. So, it was but natural that the official chronicler could not have written anything against the sultan. So, this is a kind of manipulation that I am talking about. This is a kind of biasness that I am talking about. So, whatever we study on the basis of those literatures are all right, but then we have to be very cautious. Why a particular historian was writing certain things needs to be understood. But in the case of the earlier period, that is the early medieval period, since there, was, there is an absence of the literatures, the only source available are the inscriptional records and the archaeological excavations. And in that sense, the possibility of the manipulation through human biasness is little less. Now, many historians believe that it is largely because of this fact that you do not have the literary sources available and you have whole lot of inscription and other archaeological excavations available for the period. This period is much more debatable. That is the scope for debate 
increases and that is why the history for this period or the historiography for the period is much more interesting for the students. In fact, if one gets something in a more structured form, normally it happens that we do not try to delve into the other sub subsidiary sources. We do not try to look at those other sources and that has happened with the Delhi Sultanate also. What we have done over the years is that we have emphasized on those structured literary sources because the, these are easily available to us. So, we have not tried to look into those inscriptional records of the Delhi Sultanate with that much emphasis that we saw for the earlier period. Since here everything is av available to us in a written form in the Persian documents and in a well structured manner, we study the history of the period following those lines. And then there is a possibility of all of us getting trapped into those structures, the well defined structures, the well conceived idea with which these were written. We cannot deny that majority of the facts could be correct, but there is always a possibility of biasness in the analysis of those facts by the contemporary historians. There is also a possibility of omission of certain facts, which the historian deliberately avoids to write while he is writing the history of the Sultanate. Then there is also a possibility that a particular kind of a history was written with a particular motive. So, recent writings have come on those sources like Peter Hardy has explained and Muzaffar Alam has also explained in the literature in his uh, recent book that certain these books of the Delhi Sultanate were being written, these chronicles were being written with certain you know motive. There was certain reason behind writing such books, they wanted to prove certain points. So, that, that could be a possibility, that is one interpretation of understanding the historiography of the Delhi Sultanate. Now, let us move to the other aspect of the Delhi Sultanate. So, that is one comparison of the historical sources for the early medieval period with that of the Delhi Sultanate. The second interesting aspect for the two periods is about the understanding among the historians. There is one group of historian who suggests that this is this early medieval period is a period of disintegration. And then there are another set of historians who suggest that with the coming of the Turks, with the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate rule, the situation changes and there is a new impetus to the region and the region becomes economically prosperous. So, the decline of a state is again rising because of the coming of the Delhi Sultans. This is how things have been explained. But as we have seen, the description given by the revisionist historians, they try to see this early medieval period in a different mode. They say that there has been economic prosperity in different regions, in different parts of India and we cannot generalize the whole of India into one mode of disintegration. So, this kind of a connection that has been uh, without writing has been explained 
in the historiography is set aside by the viewpoints given by the revisionist historians. But then let us now talk about what actually happens when the Delhi Sultans come. We cannot deny the fact that with the coming of the Turks in India, new technologies came new system of administration came and new institutions came. And at the same time, we also cannot deny that all these led to new developments. But the point here to understand is that Delhi Sultanate at that time was only a region. There were many other regions in existence. So, Delhi Sultanate is not actually replacing another region, I mean another major kingdom. Delhi Sultanate is emerging as one of the important regions in the country. And then gradually we see that under powerful ruler like Alauddin Khilji and Muhammad bin Tughlaq, Delhi Sultanate emerges as a powerful Sultanate. So, we should not try to see this whole period of Delhi Sultanate into one mode. The entire Delhi Sultanate has or the whole period of Delhi Sultanate has never remained the same. Under different set of ruler, under different ruler, under different uh, dynasties of the Delhi Sultans, the power of the Delhi Sultanate has kept on fluctuating. So, this is going to be the thrust of our analysis when we try to look at the economy of the Delhi Sultanate. Now, one of the earliest historians who worked on the history of Delhi Sultanate was Muhammad Habib. In fact, in his introduction to the Eliot and Dowson's history told by its own historians, he writes about two very important developments and that he suggests as urban revolution and the rural revolution. Now, he suggests that with the coming of the Turks in India, there was a revolution of sort in Indian history. The urban area saw a revolution and the rural area also witnessed a revolution. He says that the new regimes of Delhi Sultanate was qualitatively different from the earlier ones and it is because of this fact that urban and the rural revolution took place. Now, I, as we mentioned earlier that when Muhammad Habib was probably writing, the one of the dominant views among the, I mean for the history of early medieval period was that of the Marxist scholars. And it was almost a accepted fact that this was a period of disintegration, this early medieval period. So, following those lines of the early medieval period, possibly Muhammad Habib also saw the coming of the Delhi Sultans as some form of revolution for the period. Now, when he uses the term urban revolution, he actually tried to mean the expansion of the towns and the artisanal activities with the new technologies that came with the Turks. Nobody can deny the fact on the basis of the available sources that when the Turks came here, they came here with new technologies. Now, resultantly you see the growth of spinning wheel, sericulture that is the weaving of the silk clothes, carpet weaving emerges as an important industry 
and the building technologies were also used by you know using uh, lime and cement together for vaulted roofing there was an extensive use of true dome and arc all around the buildings of the delhi sultans so all these new kinds of technologies were basically the innovation of the turks here in india obviously they brought it from persia but then they it was actually brought by to india for the first time by the turks so it is in this context that professor mohammad habib talked about the expansion of new technologies and with that emergence of new technologies came the idea of uh, or came the urban growth and there were spurt of urban centers in india at that time he further says that there was a growth of commerce which was reflected by new coinage and that has been in fact further developed by irfan habib and he suggests that the immigration of the artisans and the merchants from the islamic east to india also indicates towards the prosperous condition of the period then he also talks about the rural revolution by rural revolution he actually meant improved production by peasants due to the removal of the intermediaries irfan habib although agrees uh, with this all these changes that mohammad habib is talking about with the coming of the new regime but he has certain reservations on the use of the term revolution as such but then he also agrees that in the rural setup also there was an increase and enhancement of revenue in fact at one place uh, irfan habib suggests that the state was exploitative there was so much of revenue being collected but at the same time it became redistributive also now taking all th these uh, major hypothesis of urban and revolution uh, rural revolution into consideration let me first tell you something about the establishment of the delhi sultanate as such how they came here and how they were able to successfully establish the turkish rule in india in fact the 10th and the 11th centuries of indian history were featured with small regional kingdoms and as we have discussed many kingdoms were in the process of emergence on the other hand in central asia new kingdoms were also rising into prominence under the islamic influence there were two major centers of power in central asia and these were at gajna and kor the situation at that time in central asia was so fragile that it brought the rulers from these kingdoms to india and they tried to gain something from the indian situation in the early 11th century between the period 1000 to 1027 we find that almost 17 plundering raids were made by the delhi uh, i mean this early turkish invader mahmud of gajna and his campaigns were invariably launched in the summer months 
and before the onset of the monsoon he used to go back. We have heard a lot about his invasions, uh, his campaigns around the temple cities. Now, one of few of the important uh, temple cities like Thaneshwar, Mathura, Kannauj, Somnath, all these were looted by Mahmud Gajni. Many would suggest that these campaigns of Mahmud Gajni were primarily to spread the message of Islam. But the recent researches have shown that these raids in the temples were motivated more by economics than by religion or politics. So, the only purpose behind these raids in India was looting the wealth of the temples. Had his motive been the expansion or the spread of Islam, he would have raided the political centers of power, but that has never happened with Mahmud Gajni. He targeted only such temple cities where wealthy temples were in existence, because he, is, he had heard a whole lot of thing about the wealth lying in the gerbdri of those temples from the merchants. There were trading relations taking place from Central Asia to India at that time and merchants used to go from one place to another and there were so many kinds of stories about India at that time possibly. So that is why when Mahmud Gajni took the permission from the caliphate, he always used to suggest that he is going to spread the message of Islam and that it is only because of that you know factor that the caliphate could have given him permission to invade. But it is a fact that when he raided all these campaigns, he raided all these temples, he went back with huge wealth and then modernized the city of Gajda. So, now, it has been an established fact and there is a unanimity among the historians that the raids of the early Turks were mainly for economic reason and not for the religious reason. But almost 150 years after the invasion of Mahmud, there is another Turk who invades the territory, the northwestern and the northern part of India. Instead of looting the temples, Muhammad Ghori had a different motive. When you loot an area, the motive is obviously an e economy, I mean looting the economy or looting the treasury. So, Gaj Gajna, Muhammad of Gajna had already, you know, concentrated on that aspect. But here is another invader who concentrated on attacking the political centers of power. He had a different intention altogether. He wanted to establish an alternative kind of an empire in India, if he had certain emergent situation and he is thrown out of Central Asia. It is because of this fear that Muhammad Ghori had in Central Asia of being dethroned, that he conquered many of the North Indian territories and put his own governors there to rule on his behalf. And that is the difference that we find between Mahmud Ghajni's invasion and Muhammad Ghori. Mahmud Ghajni never appointed any governor, Muhammad Ghori did appoint governors because he wanted to, apart from looting the territory, he wanted to continue 
in those ter territories continue to collect revenue on a sustainable basis and that is why he appointed governors there. Now, Mohammad Ghori had uh, fought two important battles with uh, Prithvi Ra Chauhan, one in 1191 and another in 1192. And in this second battle, Prithvi Ra Chauhan was defeated and then Mahmud was able to almost establish another an alternative empire in the north and northwestern part of India. You can see here in this map the directions that Mohammad Ghori has followed while attacking the territories in India. Now, the, you will find two kinds of shades in the arrows that indicate towards the invasions. One is in grey shade and an, another one in this dark shade. Now, the grey shade indicates the early invasions of Mohammad Ghori and the darker ones are the indicators of the second phase of his campaigns. So, in the initial years, his campaigns are largely concentrated to northwestern part of India. But in the second phase, that is after 1194, he has moved a little further, uh, 1192, he has lit, moved a little further and he has moved, in fact, entered into the northern and even the eastern part of India. It is during his lifetime only that Muhammad Ghori had announced that his Turkish slaves would be the highest to his dominions in India. And then he went back to his projects in Central Asia. But finally, although he had appointed different governors in different areas, it was Kutubudi in Aibak who emerged successful in taking control of the Indian territories and gave the foundation for the Delhi Sultanate in India. In fact, uh, there were four governors appointed by Muhammad Ghori. Yalduz was appointed at Gajna, Kabacha at Uch. Kutubudi Nebak at Delhi, Bhaktiyar Khalji at Bengal, but it was finally Kutubudi Nebak with certain conflicts and association with the nobles that he was able to prove himself to be the successor of Muhammad Ghori in the territories of India. He ruled for almost four or five years, but after that came Iltutmish then came Rajya and Balban. Now, Kutubudi Nebak throughout his four or five years was always involved in saving his own existence, trying to consolidate himself. He was busy, you know, aligned with one noble group or with the other, another. So, his whole period just passed by without much expansion taking place. It was only under El Tutmish that we find that the territories of the Delhi Sultanate which was founded by Kutubuddin in Abak, got expanded. If you look at the few of the highlights of El Tutmish rule, we will see that Hiltutmish was, since he was a little, you know, uh, much more freer than Kutubuddin Ebak in terms of conflicts within the Sultanate's uh, nobility, Sultan's uh, coterie, the group of people who ruled. He was able to come out with certain innovations, 
certain new administrative setups and institutions. He introduced silver tanka and copper jital. It was a purely Arabic coinage, which was issued from Delhi. He also was able to introduce one of the important institutions of the Delhi Sultanate, the Iktadari system. Then he was also able to organize his team of loyal nobles as Turkane Chehelgani. Because of this creation of the royal nobles, loyal ones, he was able to set aside the power I mean the power of the opposing nobles and he was able to successfully do his campaigns and introduce his reforms. He was also able to complete the construction of Qutub Minar in Delhi. His accession to the throne of Delhi constituted an important landmark in the history of Delhi Sultanate. It marked the growing power of the Turkish, Turkish nobility in India. The power of decision making rested uh, within the nobility alone and Delhi became the hub of the political activity of the Turkish rule at that time. It was after Iltutmish there were certain conflicts because Rajya, he uh, announced Rajya to be the next Sultan and there were conflicts all around. There were politics within the Delhi Sultanate among the nobility of once again. One of his own nobles within the Turkane Chehelgani Balban later immersed as king maker and then he himself becomes the sultan of Delhi, crushing the power of the Turkish nobility. And in fact, since he knew the drawbacks of those Turkane Chehelgani, he suppressed the power of those Tal Turkane Chehelgani group once he becomes the ruler. Here in this slide, you will find the map of Delhi Sultanate in 1236 and you can see that under Iltutmish, the Delhi Sultanate had covered almost the whole of northwestern and northern eastern India up to the Deccan. When Balban came to rule, he declared himself as the representative of God on earth. That is, the Sultan is the representative. He introduced the practice of Sizda and Paibos. In fact, Sizda was a practice in which people were required to kneel down and touch the feet, touch the ground with the head of where the Sultan was sitting. Then he also abolished uh, this whole group of Tarkane Chehalgani abolished the post of Nayak and it all, all these things were done to consolidate and increase and enhance the power of the Sultan. Balban also gave instructions to the Ulumas to confine themselves to religious affair, not to engage in political activities. He also reinforced the force of Matinda, Sunam, Samana in Northwestern to check the Mon Mongol advance that had started during that period. But one of the greatest contribution of Balban to the history of Delhi Sultanate was his creation of Diwane Arch. It was a military affairs department. During the reign of Khaljis and the Tughlaqs, the doors of the nobility was no longer the sole preserve of the Turks alone. Positions of the nobility now got open and people from diverse backgrounds were made nobles. 
if you look at the hierarchy of the administration here in this slide, we see that the at the apogee is the sultan at the top, sultan is sitting and then under him you have the ulama, arizamu malik and the iktadars. But then this whole sultanate of Delhi is divided into provinces, into parganas and parganas into villages. The sultan was obviously the nucleus of the administrative machinery and the entire territory was under his rule alone. He was the supreme authority, he was the head of the administrative system. Ulama used to occupy an important position in the scheme of the sultanate, no doubt, in, they functioned as judiciary and it normally followed the shariat, the Islamic law. But when it came to the interpretation of law by the sultan, many of the powerful sultans were able to follow the jawabit like Alauddin Khilji. Wazirs were also appointed to head certain departments and they normally supervised the functioning of the various departments. They also acted as advisors and they were given various state responsibility not only for taking care of the functions of different department but also sometimes they were given the responsibility of military expeditions. The wazir's office also kept a check on the land revenue collections and from different parts of the empire and they had a whole lot of functions they had a wazirat who used to maintain a record of the income and expenditure incurred by the state. But all these features that we are discussing here became much more prominent only when powerful rulers like Alauddin Khilji and Muhammad bin Tughlaq came. If we look at the functionaries of those provincial level, we will say that the sultanate was divided into different provinces headed by the governor and the shikdar and then the fauzdar. Shikdar was the collector of the revenue and the fauzdar was maintenance, uh, maintaining the law and order of the provinces. We also had village level functionaries like patwaris, khuts and the mukaddams and we will find that under powerful rulers like Alauddin Khilji, these village headmans like Khuts Mukaddams and Chaudhuris were reduced to the position of only land holding, uh, land holders and they were not given the task of acting as intermediaries between the peasant and the state. So, in fact, they were also supposed to give revenue to the state. They were not exempted from giving revenue to the state. The Delhi Sultanate was an important and it emerged as an important powerful Sultanate largely because of its military strength. As we mentioned that there was a department called Diwane Urge instituted and it was headed by Arize Malik and this whole army was based on the multiples of 10 that is the decimal system and it was the basis of the army of Delhi Sultanate. There used to be a Sarkhal who commanded 10 chosen horsemen. And then one Sipa Salar used to command 10 Sarkhals and similarly Amils with 10 uh, Sipa Salars, Maliks with 10 Amirs, Khans with 10 Maliks and 10 Khans were under the direct command of the Sultan. So this was a kind of hierarchy of the military system of 
Delhi Sultanate. Now, this whole military setup of Delhi Sultanate was not possible without the collection of revenue from the countryside. But this collection of revenue from the countryside became widespread only under the sultans like Alauddin Khalji and Mohammed bin Tughlaq. Sunil Kumar has in fact suggested in his recent book that in the early years of the Delhi Sultanate, the Delhi Sultans or the Delhi Sultanate was just a garrison town that the forts were created in Delhi and the surrounding regions of Delhi were the areas from where um, from which the Sultans used to collect revenue. It is because of this possibly little revenue in comparison to the later period available to the Sultan that the early Sultans of Delhi Sultanate were not able to create a huge standing army. And that is why when they came to India, they found the Iktadari system to be the best possible setup through which they could have collected the revenue as well as they could have expanded and consolidated the territory. But before discussing the working of the Siktadari system, let me tell you about the income of the state. What are the various incomes of the state at that time of the Delhi Sultanate? The state held large tracts of land and they were known as the Khalisa land, which were tilled by the farmers. And the revenue from these Khalisa land came to the central treasury through an agency of officials called the Amils. We have different categories of taxation principles. And in fact, as per the Muslim law, there are two categories of taxation. One is called Fai and the other called Zakat. Fai in, in fact means the, it is in Arabic means the booty obtained from the, uh, by the infidel, from the infidels and the zakat is tax paid by all the practicing Muslims. And then the five was further divided into the Khams, Zazia and Kharaj. Zakat was a tax on flocks, commerce and agriculture. Kham was one fifth of the booty and Jajia was imposed on the non-Muslims. In return for the Jajia, the non-Muslims or the non-believers got the protection of the life and property and they also used to get exemption from the military services. Kharaj was purely a tax on cultivation which was collected during the Delhi Sultanate. Now in order to collect all these various kind of sources, the Delhi Sultans appointed a host of officers like the Amil and the Karkoons and they were assisted in the initial years by the intermediaries called the Khuts, Mukaddams and Chaudhrys. It was only from the second half of the 13th century that we find that the central authority suddenly becomes very powerful and it comes out with its own machinery of administration under Alauddin Khalji. And the already existing institution of Vikta suddenly becomes very effective and efficient. Now let me tell you something about this Ikta system. Ikta was basically a territorial assignment and it was given to the administrative officials, the military officers and the nobles in lieu of the service that they used to provide to the state. 
they were these ikta holders were also known as the mukti and these muktis apart from being the administrative head were also responsible for the collection of revenue from these territories now as i told you earlier that the sikhtadari system was the best possible option for the early delhi sultans they did not have much idea of the system of revenue collection in india at that time and this implementation of the ikta system solved two problems at the same time one of controlling the territory through their military officials and the other of collecting revenue from the countryside through these military officials so what these muktis used to do was that once they used to get the ikta a particular area of land was won over by the delhi sultans they were given to the ikta holders the nobles and they were required to retain the revenue uh, i mean the amount of revenue which was equivalent to their personal pay as well as the salary of the troops that you, they used to maintain and whatever surplus that they collected it was sent to the treasury of the sultan now the one of the important sources for understanding this the institution of ikta is a work by nizamul mulk to see called siyasat nama but apart from these ikta territories the sultans also used to have a khalisa land it this kind of a land was directly under the control of the sultan and it was deliberately kept by the sultan to maintain his own officials and himself professor irfan habib has suggested that ikta was in fact the most important institution and it worked for the centralization of the delhi sultanate in fact we have reference to the transfers of ikta by the sultans and this has been highlighted by many of the historians from aligarh but another important aspect that needs to be understood is that this is a not a general phenomenon or a situation the whole institution of ikta keeps on changing under different rulers for example under balban you find that the many of the iktas were converted into the khalisa land that is the direct possession of the sultan in fact he tried to curtail the power of the nobles that's why he, he took away many of the older iktas and then he also appointed accountants to ascertain the actual revenue available in a particular ikta and appointed many barids also in informers to report the activities of the iktadars but under alauddin khilji a completely new kind of a ikta is visible alauddin khilji had was a very powerful kingdom uh, king and the sultan and he had been able to establish almost an all india kind of an empire starting from northern india down to south in fact with his expansion with his invasions he was able to assign iktas even to far off regions
but then when he actually expanded the territory of the delhi sultanate he gained a lot in terms of revenue and it is because of this fact that he was able to create a huge standing army this practice of collection of revenue continued even under the next powerful ruler muhammad bin tughlaq but then alauddin khilji's rule is very interesting now if you look at the economic measures of alauddin khilji all these measures are largely connected to the consolidation of the ruler himself and the consolidation of the delhi sultanate also he started collecting revenue in grains introduced many reforms he his first target was the creation of a huge standing army but that could not have been possible without much revenue coming to the state treasury so if he wanted a huge standing army a huge efficient standing army he needed to give them salaries and cash that much cash was not available to him so he introduced another set of reforms called the market regulation system market reforms it is believed that he introduced market reforms because he could not have given much salary to the soldiers as we find today that our military officials in india are today given uh, the csd facilities now think of alauddin khilji almost 500 years back he had come out with this idea of market reforms for the military officials only so overall looking at the whole scenario of delhi sultanate we may suggest that delhi sultanate in the initial years emerged only as a region but gradually it evolved into a powerful state under rulers like alauddin khilji and muhammad bin tughlaq so throughout this period of delhi sultanate the sultanate remained not similar in its nature so with friends with these words we conclude the lecture i thank all of you for watching the lecture on behalf of i thank dr ripul singh for giving such an insightful lecture on the economic system during the delhi sultanate thank you very much